name is Heather Murray and we're in my studio and ready to embark on a creative journey together. Uh, today's project is mixed media portrait art and we're going to start with a simple block of wood like this, a piece of pine that's gesso, and we're going to turn it into a wonderful mixed media masterpiece. So stay with me and we're going to embark on the journey together. And uh, you'll find that through a few easy steps, you'll be able to achieve a lovely piece of art. And I'll walk you through. The supplies are all easy to obtain, um, nothing too fancy. And um, I'm hoping that you'll use this art as a template for your own creative adventures ahead and a springboard for other kinds of, of art ideas in the future. Okay, so we're ready to begin. Let's go. Welcome to my art studio in Owen Sound, Ontario, Canada. And this is my own personal sanctuary, a place that I create and um, find all sorts of ways to experiment in art and, and creative endeavors. It's lovely to have a space that you can call your own. If you can uh, use a kitchen table or a small table somewhere, or if you're lucky enough to have a a bedroom that isn't being used or even a closet if you can get your supplies in there it's a wonderful way to get yourself going and keep on track with your art projects um, some people ask me how do I keep working all the time and I know that part of the reason that I work so often and so uh, so regularly is because I have a space to be able to set up and that I don't have to put everything away all the time and I can keep stock of my my projects from time to time. It's nice to have all my materials around me and some of my personal items that may not belong in my home setting but they they tend to make me smile and give me joy in the environment I'm working in. So you can see there's an old kitchen table that I use and a drafting table. They're full of paint and I don't really worry about that. I, I find it I'm not the kind of artist that can work in a really pristine environment, so I enjoy having different odds and ends around me, and when it gets too messy, then that's time to straighten up a bit, but usually I, I'm happy with a little bit of clutter, and I realize that also defines my personal space. It's important to find a place of your own to work. Uh, it's important to find a place of your own to play. So if you want to keep growing and um, exercise lots of opportunities to make stuff and, and draw and paint, then, then find a place that you can work in and uh, let everyone else know around you that this is your space. <laughs> that's my recommendation. So with that, that's my studio and uh, I think we're getting close to being ready to begin. So here's a brief introduction to the materials we will use in this project. There's a pine substrate which is painted with gesso and uh, just an overview of my table with my acrylic paints, my ephemera, my matte paper with the image on it, the finished product. <laughs> Seems out of sequence now but it, we will get there. And um, just something, you could also use a canvas board for this project 
today I've used the, the pine board but canvas works as well and I use photo matte paper because it's durable. Um, the different kinds of ephemera you might collect vintage papers, tissue paper, Japanese paper, it's all wonderful and so a little pair of sharp scissors will do, uh, water, um, a variety of acrylic paints um, and also a palette yours will probably look cleaner than mine <laughs> and brushes you'll have all different sizes of brushes but I like to have a a good size uh, brush for this kind of project as well as some fine brushes too um, so that's all you really need it's kind of wonderful really um, the matte medium is important um, the different kinds of um, ephemera is important it'll all be uniquely yours uh, when you finish and there you have it that's a list of my supplies or a visual list of my supplies uh, there's the matte medium which I will speak a lot of it's my very special favorite um, tool in this kind of work and there's my table and uh, just an overview of everything you'll be using uh, again the gesso so you can see it's you can buy whatever brand suits you I I experiment a little with the brands and with prices, so that's about it. Are you ready to go? Because now we know what we're working with and I think we're ready to start. one of the most frequent questions I get asked is where do I find my images? I, I'm a real scavenger. I look around at flea markets and sometimes I buy online or from people I know uh, and look for beautiful old photographs. I'm really, I look for faces that I'm attracted to that, that will tell a story, that have some soul. Um, I, I find that it's really thrilling to discover uh, faces from the past that resonate some kind of history and some kind of feelings. So I treasure my special photographs and sometimes I use them often. I scan them and it takes a little bit of computer know-how to do this. So you might want to consult with someone. I won't go through the whole scanning process on these pictures because most um, I had to sort of figure it out for myself through the program. And they're pretty self-explanatory. They're getting easier now. So. You can resize them, you can crop them. Sometimes there'll be one figure that I'm really attracted to in a group photograph and that's the person I will pull out to work with. Um, so I would say start your collection if you haven't already. It's wonderful to work with these old images and uh, they are quite timeless. I love that idea that we can continue to uh, carry on the tradition of these families and these people by, um, by incorpor incorporating them into our art. So that's fun. Keep a little suitcase or a place uh, where you store your photographs that's, that's uh, treasured and you'll be very excited with what you can do with these images. Now I also will find an occasional copyright free image on the web. And again, I have to play with it a little bit to get what I want. Um, what I will say is find a photo program you can work with. Um, and also, I would en encourage you to, to try to print out your picture in black and white and high contrast. That's really important because you get the details. Um, you get um, some information to work with when you're using your paint. Some people get very frustrated if they're working with an old picture and it's faded and they, it's very sepia colored and they don't get the, the same kind of um, intensity with the figure. And these faces are very important. They have a lot of character. So the high contrast, and sometimes you can play with your photo program to capture that high contrast. Um, so play around with it and see what you come out with using high quality matte paper, photo matte paper, uh, you'll find that the results are way better. And there's my, my dog watching over me. <laughs>
Okay, now we're ready to get into some of the fun stuff. We're starting with a plain pine board, which I actually had cut at the hardware store. Um, often hardware stores will, will cut your board for free or they'll offer a, f a certain amount of free cuts and I found this was actually more reasonable than buying canvas. It's a little more work because you have to paint it with gesso in order to paint over it. It, it provides a primer for your paint and for your project and it also preserves the, the wood. Um, and I would paint on all sides because this way you'll discourage warping and uh, it's, it's all kind of fun to get into the gesso and start painting it. I use a, a wide brush and uh, with this particular recording I'm looking a little bit more um, awkward about it but generally it's I find it quite easy to paint the whole board and all the sides and you will too. It's, it's really it's just like it's just like child's play. I, I wait till one side is dry before I paint the other because otherwise if you have a messy table like I do full of different powders and papers and things you'll pick it up. So I wait till that side is dry and then I'll flip it and then I'll work and I'll paint the other side as well too. It just keeps your board in good shape and um, hopefully it'll last forever. And there's the gesso. Uh, as I mentioned before it's, it's really personal what kind of gesso that you buy but um, buying it in a larger container or jar will certainly last you longer. It's more economical. Now that we've prepared our substrate and it's dried, um, one thing I like to do, it, can't, it doesn't necessarily have to be in this order, but I just find it for our purposes, I like to cut out the image rather soon in my project. And I've printed this, this particular image off on a sort of a pinkish matte paper. And I don't know why I did that, but I, I, I rather like the results. Uh, it shows some flesh through the, um, the white areas and it just makes it a little bit more interesting but I would typically use white photo matte paper and I cut very carefully I try to even capture the hairs on the figure and cut off everything that's not necessary like the bottom obviously or anything I want to take off and fit to my project so um, again to personalize this figure you want to take away all the background and make sure that you clip her properly so you don't change her, her features and you capture her hair and all the edges very, very um, cautiously. I use, um, I use sharp, um, small, almost childlike scissors and I find that that works best for this kind of a, a chopping situation. <laughs> all right, there we go, easy. All right, I might be just cutting a few more details and then I decide where I'm going to place it. So I've already got the substrate is dry, so we're ready to see where she goes. Okay, we're ready to start. Uh, I have my matte medium on my brush and I have a variety of acrylic paint in a small palette and I like to blend kind of haphazardly whatever works for me. I play with uh, the different shades and mix them until I get a uh, color that I'm very happy with and sometimes when I discover a new color color blend then it, it's something that I just keep using over and over again because it's quite thrilling. <laughs> I'll, I'll blend in some matte medium with my color just to um, add a little bit of texture to my background and we're, we're painting the whole wood here. I like to paint the entire piece of wood or the entire substrate whether it be canvas or wood and just cover it completely. Um, sometimes I'll use various colors. For today I'm blending 
different shades of blue and green and a little bit of white. Um, for the white I just used gesso and then I mix in a, a little bit of matte medium again for the fluid texture. I find this kind of painting very soothing. It, it allows me to play with color and blend and there's no right or wrong way of doing it. I use colors of acrylic paint that appeal to me and you might choose ochres or, or reds or oranges or other kinds of shades, purple. Um, so don't, don't hold back, experiment with what, uh, whatever color you like to use um, and, and have fun with it. When my, my paint is dry, or dry-ish, I add another layer of matte medium. And then here I've selected some elements to add some interest to my, my piece. And I've got this wonderful tissue paper with texture and a little bit of detail on it. I'm covering my board with more matte medium. And this will act as a glue in this situation. There we go. There's the matte medium. <laughs> and you wouldn't paint you wouldn't paint the matte medium on the paper. You would paint it directly on the surface because it's so fragile and, and tissue-like that you want it to um, adhere quite easily. And then um, I just quickly add another coat of matte medium on top. And this both seals it and flattens out some of the wrinkles and edges. So you see how we're using layers to start this piece. I don't worry about cutting the edges at this point, I just lay down my tissue. And you can do the same with your papers, whatever you happen to use. And here's another little piece I found, it's a little piece of Japanese paper with a lovely design and I just thought it looked a little plain at the bottom and so you, you would add and play around with what pieces appeal to you and what kinds of papers catch your eye. And I've just added it on again with more matte medium, both underneath and on top. And there we have it. And if I just start to position my image around, it gives me a sense of what I want to say with this piece. So here we're preparing our background for the image. And we, in order to do this, we're adding lots of gel medium again. And I'm painting it both on the surface of the board as well as on the back of the, the image. And I'm only doing it awkwardly like this because it's hard to show it to you in this little frame. But I think you get the idea. You paint on the back of the image and also the substrate. And then you add an extra coat of gel medium on top. I feel it's important to add as much gel medium as you can or gel matte medium as you can to your piece because it, it adheres the, the paper to the substrate and it also blends your subject very nicely in with its background so it becomes more of a painting. Uh, it also it also allows us to have a surface to work on with the paint. If you paint strictly onto the paper, the acrylic paint won't, won't work quite as well. So here I am adding a little bit of cheek color, a little lip color, and I do stress a little. I'm using my fingers as a blender because they're kind of like an, another um, brush appendage of mine. <laughs> so just try to use a little because you don't want these giant apple cheeks unless you're looking for that effect but if you want if you're aiming for realism then you, you don't want to put too much color um, using a little bit of gel medium with the acrylic will give you a more of a liquidy uh, substance to work with and as you can see I use a very fine brush there I am blending again with my fingers <laughs> a little brush work a little fingers um, I find I have a little bit more control that way and I'm just adding a little touch of brown, maybe like an umber, 
um, to the shadows. Uh, working with the shadows in your picture, your, your photograph is giving you a, a template to work from. So if you follow what it offers you, you'll find you have much success. Um, I use a tinier brush when I want to get details. And as you can see, that's what I'm using right now is a fairly fine brush. Uh, around the eyes are tricky. It's so easy to kind of make a big blob but um, I'm putting this paint on very sparingly with maybe more medium than acrylic paint. And blending, blending, blending. I can always add more later, but it's harder to take off at this, this point. So just wherever I see shadows, I add a little bit of, little bit of brown. Uh, it really makes your, your figure pop. And uh, again, you're, if you're aiming for a painterly effect like I am, I think it's important to be careful about your paints and um, be delicate and you know aware of what you're doing. There's my palette. It's as you can see quite layered with paint. I sometimes I'll pay, I'll peel the whole thing off and start again because the acrylic paint you can see it has a plasticized kind of quality so you can do that but I can always see the paints I'm working with they're, they're generally wet so that's all that matters you may prefer a cleaner um, palette than I do and here I'm adding a little bit of um, I, I think just with a what because I've used a, a pink paper I really want the pink skin to to be highlighted in order to do that, I want to change the color of this, this figure's garment. And I've added a little bit of, used my gesso as a white, and then added a little tiny, tiny bit of yellow to blend it. I mean, I could demonstrate how I do this, but I think it's very experimental. That You have to do it to your own taste. And for me to prescribe your color, it's, it's important for you to, to find what color palette you like to work within. I tend to, with these figures, I tend to work really lightly. I, I build on the color as opposed to starting with a really deep color and then trying to hold on to it because, again, you're kind of stuck with it once you get it really dark. So I like some of the, the image to show through. And in order to do that, I have to add some gel medium or water to create this effect. So you can see I'm careful. <laughs> and I may add a little detail that isn't in there, like the suggestion of a lace collar, for instance, with my brushwork. And a little dab of white on my finger to that, that little dot that we see sometimes in our eyes that make our eyes glow and come alive. And you can see that our, our girl, she's coming alive a little bit more with those dots. And a little tiny, tiny bit of white in, in the whites of the eyes as well. And, uh, and carefully a little dot for glimmer on the lips and on the nose. So, Again, I'm very, very frugal with my color because I would much rather have the features shine through. And so this is probably the toughest part is to practice with this. And don't be discouraged if at first you feel, oh no, I can't get the color right or, you know, it's not working. It's really a matter of experimenting and working with your tools. And again, tiny areas, detail areas, tiny brushes, larger areas, large brushes. Okay, this next step is highly personal. I like the effect of painted sides on a canvas or on a block of wood. And you might be using either one for this project, but I think it, it adds a nice finishing touch to your piece when you have either black or colored painted sides. Some people even carry the picture, the colors in the picture over to the sides. Black is my is my paint of choice. Um, the trick with this is to get the right brush size so that you get a kind of an even line and practice, practice, practice. Uh, and if you get a little sloppy, don't worry about it. The consistency of the paint helps. Uh, if you don't have it too thick or too, too dry and it's got a little bit of either gel medium or water in it, it helps a whole lot. Um, and the next step um, I like to, especially if I'm not too neat, but this is kind of a new um, technique I've been doing with particularly the wooden pieces, and 
I think it gives a little bit of an age and effect to the piece. It's just a brush very, very lightly with a drier brush and a little bit of black paint around the very, very edges of your piece. You can see I'm, I'm kind of letting it run a little bit. It may, I'm not sure how evident that is for you from this, this particular view, but that's what I'm doing is I'm just blending a tiny bit around the edges and not worrying. And then, because sometimes I'm not entirely pleased with my colors, I may add a little bit of extra intensity at the end. Like here I am adding a bit more, almost an aqua tone to my background. I just, for me, that feels a little more complete and rich than the other uh, paler color. Um, typically I like to paint it on the bottom first and get the put the, the layers on afterwards but I can also touch up and you can do the same later. Um, the rules are not rigid. <laughs> but the idea is to have fun and to work with what appeals to your eyes. I've also added another layer of gel medium to this piece. It, I may end up adding several layers that all dry clear and it adds a beautiful sealant to your painting. So don't be shy about your gel medium. And there we have a sawtooth hanger on the back of our wood. They're really easy, you can get them at the hardware store, just hammer them in. For a wood piece such as this, you need it because, well, it doesn't, it doesn't take too long. Well just hanging on a nail like a canvas does. So there we have it, ta-da, there's our piece. So that was pretty easy, wasn't it? I, I encourage you to um, play with this medium and to have fun with it. I encourage you to find interesting images. Maybe they're your own relatives. Maybe they're just a really fascinating face, but the main thing is enjoy, create, experiment, have fun. Well, here we are in my backyard and away from the studio, and there's a couple of my goats. <laughs> I just have a few parting words for you, a few thoughts about um, my idea of what's important in the creative process. And I, I know a lot of people who say they're stuck and they, they're lost for ideas and lost for time. And I encourage you to find the time for yourself and to shelter both time and space for yourself to create. I think it's very empowering. And uh, I think you'll grow when you pay attention to your world, when you open up your senses, when you start to unravel what's the important pieces in your life and the beauty that you wish to respond to. It may be the beauty or it may be something that you feel strongly about. It might be a, a strong emotion you are going through. It could be many things, but to be responsive and to have an open mind to the world around you, I think is a really brilliant So inspiration can come from many places. Uh, for me, it's my, my chickens and the world around me, nature, uh, various creatures in my life uh, that make me smile and uh, offer me some, 
some ideas for my work. So just think about what inspires you, what's in your world that, that makes you tick and what you enjoy. Uh, be playful, be adventurous, and enjoy art.